be me. 29 years old and a caver by hobby. I took a trip to Europe last summer because they have some amazing caves that I've always wanted to explore. The plan was to visit Spain, France, Switzerland and Austria over the course of three weeks. My visit to Spain went really well. I visited BU 56 and the Chama de la Corniza. The sheer depth of these caves is astounding. It feels like you're completely cut off from the world. Especially when you are alone down there. I went through a pretty bad breakup just before my trip. I really needed to get away from my life for a while. The feeling of isolation was therapeutic for me. It would have been totally ruined if I was with a tour group. I took a train from Barcelona to Valence. The next cave I'd visit was the Gufra Burger, then the Gufra Miralda, after that. I was really excited for Miralda. It's one of the deepest caves in the entire world. At 6 in the morning on my 8th day, I descended into the Gufra Burger. I used one of the side entrances that tour groups tend to avoid. There was a single rope tied around a tree and lowered down a hole in the ground that I attached to my harness. I dropped into the earth like a stone. The cave was absolutely massive on the inside. Far bigger than what you'd expect from the unassuming little hole in the ground. The limestone stalagmites even taller than I am stood next to a gorgeous emerald pool. I've seen it all before in photos, of course, but in real life, the scenery grabs hold of you. It doesn't let go, even long after you've returned to the light of day. I have a map of the cave with me, as well as a couple backups, so I can explore without too much worry of getting lost. I venture deeper into the cave, attaching my harness to the various ropes that were hanging from spikes in the walls. Although practical, I always disliked these safety ropes. They're just too much of a reminder that other people have been here. For the next several hours, I climbed down into the cave. I couldn't help but grin as it got darker and my headlamp became less effective at illuminating my surroundings. I descended into a massive clearing. It was a tall room of stone with the sound of falling water droplets echoing around. I knew the general shape of the room from schematics and my maps, but the room was so large and dark that I couldn't confirm it with my eyes. Despite having a headlamp and powerful flashlight with me, the darkness was impenetrable. I unclipped myself from the rope and found a nice smooth area to lay on. I hadn't gotten that much sleep the night before, so I decided to take a little nap. Sleeping in a cave is one of the most relaxing experiences you can ever have. Maybe it's only me, or just a primal instinct left behind by my primitive ancestors but I find the cool open air and secluded feeling of a cave far more comforting than that of a bed with a blanket. I closed my eyes and drifted off. I awoke a few hours later, refreshed and ready for more caving. Part of the fun of sleeping in a cave is guessing how long you'd been out. I once slept in a cave for over six hours back in New Mexico. I got up, dusted myself off and returned to my spelunking. As I walked along the chasm, I found a small crawl space. It wasn't on my map and I'd never heard of it before. My curiosity got the better of me and I plunged headfirst into the tight squeeze. It was far from the most strained space I'd ever been in in a cave, so I wasn't too worried and I was very careful not to accidentally get stuck. After a minute or so of crawling, I reached an opening. This part of the cave, although visually similar, felt very different to me. 
the darkness that once granted me comfort now felt like an inescapable straitjacket. I then noticed drawings on the wall across from me. They were of stick people hunting a bull. The wall was covered in these cave paintings. I was utterly astounded by my discovery. The only cave paintings I'd ever seen before in person were just modern graffiti. Despite my fear, I pressed on and studied the paintings. One was of a person making what appeared to be bread over a fire. Some were handprints overlapping each other. The colors were surprisingly vibrant. The paintings were mostly composed of blacks, reds and browns but every now and again. There would be yellow and even green. And the detail on some of the livestock these people kept was also amazing. My curiosity drove me wild and I dove deeper into the cave. I was very careful when descending. This was uncharted territory, at least in modern times. If I got stuck down here, it's unlikely anyone would be able to help me. Luckily for me the way down was mostly composed of slopes and very short drop-offs. Nothing I couldn't climb back up. I got to what seemed to be the bottom without any problems. There were even more cave paintings down here. One painting was of a chicken with its head cut off. A stickman held the body up, victoriously. The head lay on the ground at his feet. A few feet to the right of it was a mural depicting some kind of primitive god. It was a tall stickman with three horns on top of its head pointing upwards. The horns had a slight curve halfway up. There were two horns on the right side of its head and one on the left. There were about a dozen stick figures bowing to the giant with their heads against the ground. I decided that I had enough exploring for the day and that it was time for me to leave. I turned to leave, but when I did, I noticed something very strange about the chicken painting. The horned giant was next to the man, and it seemed that the man was holding the chicken's body up to the giant as an offering. I didn't remember the giant being there the last time I looked at the painting. I didn't think much of the inconsistency at first. I figured that in the darkness of the cave, I must have not noticed him. A little creeped out, I turned to the slope I arrived from. It was gone. Where I remember it being was just a rock wall with a new painting on it. The horned giant was drinking the blood from a lamb whose throat was cut. I try not to panic and figure I must have gotten turned around. I keep my feet planted firmly and look around me. The slope must be somewhere nearby. I didn't walk that far from it. But it's nowhere to be seen. Instead there are only more paintings. In one, a pig is sacrificed. In another, a cow's leg is ripped off by the horned giant and seemingly eaten. As I faced forward, the nature of the paintings became undeniable. The painting in front of me was no longer of a lamb. It was of a person laying flat on an altar of some kind. The horned giant is holding the person's heart in its hand. He is surrounded by people bowing with their heads to the floor. I can practically hear the screams of the dying sacrifice. I stumble backwards. I turn and sprint into the darkness, desperate to find the exit. Not the greatest decision I've ever made, but I panicked. I call for help, but no one answers. I cower in a corner and cover my eyes like a scared child. My entire body is trembling. Minutes felt like hours in that cave. Suddenly, I hear something slam into the rock around me. My eyes jolt open and I look around for what is making the noise. I'm in a completely different place now. A new painting is on the wall across from me. I'm completely scared out of my wits. The thumping is getting louder. 
The painting shows the same altar as before with the horned giant standing behind it. On the left are seven or eight people. One doesn't have a head. Another has his heart hovering above him. A couple of them don't seem to have anything physically wrong with them, but for whatever reason, they seem lifeless. One doesn't have legs. On the right of the altar are three more people. I can hear the thumping getting closer. The figure next to the altar is wearing some kind of hat. There are three lines emanating from it. It's a helmet with a light on it. My stomach drops as I realize who the painting is showing. It's me. I slowly stand up, the thumping and shaking is right next to me. Then, out of the darkness, a creature emerges. It is absolutely massive and with the head of a bull, but with three great horns protruding from its head. It basically looks like a minotaur. I scream and run, but it's too late. It grabs me. Before I can even make sense of my surroundings, the giant slams me down onto a stone slab. As he does, memories flood my mind. My ex-fiancé is standing in front of me. She hands me an ultrasound picture. It's of our baby. A baby I never had the chance to know. A baby she aborted without even telling me. I scream in agony. I would have done anything to bring my child back. I'd have happily sold my soul to the horned giant or any other god or demon if it means giving my baby a chance at life. I feel its horn stab into my chest. More memories swarm my mind. I feel all the grief and sadness of my lost child wash over me all at once. I hear whispers in the dark. There are people surrounding the altar, bowing and chanting. I beg them for help. They don't acknowledge me. The painting of the altar changes once again. This time I am on the left side of the altar with the others who have been sacrificed. I later found myself climbing. Sunlight was shining down on my face. I was very near the surface of the cave. To this day I don't remember how I got there. I felt very dazed but otherwise normal. I didn't have any stab wounds on my chest, or any other injuries. It was like the whole thing didn't happen. But as I traveled back to my hotel room, I realized that there was something else in my life that it was as if never happened. I had no love in my heart for my child. I couldn't care less about it. When I later looked at the ultrasound I keep with me, I felt nothing. No grief, sadness, anger. Nothing. I didn't end up traveling to Switzerland. I barely left my hotel room over the next week and a half. And now, nearly a year later, I still don't care. My ex-fiancé tried to call me and work things out. She made an emotional plea. She said that she didn't know what came over her and that she regrets her decision more than anything else in her life. She would do anything to change it. I didn't say a word to her. I just hung up the phone and blocked her number. I don't feel anything for that part of my life anymore. I still do feel, don't get me wrong. I feel happy when I'm eating a good meal and sad when I see news reports of people suffering. But for my ex-fiancé and my child, I have no emotions whatsoever. For whatever purpose, the horned giant took those feelings from me. I sometimes wonder if the other two people still to be sacrificed will be as lucky as I was.